everyone. Welcome back to Litigation Help. My name is Heather Hergutman. In today's video, we're going to talk about how to insert hyperlinks in your electronic court documents for virtual hearings. So joining me here are our regular speakers, Dan Rossman and Heather Douglas, both civil litigators in Toronto. Dan's going to take us through on how he puts together uh, his motion record, and Heather's going to be also um, giving us tips along the way. So Dan, I'm going to pass this over to you now. Today we're going to discuss hyperlinking documents before the court. So first I'll talk about in a Word document how you would link to an outside case maybe in your factum or in your notice of motion or something that, that you're going to do it at the Word document level. Second, we'll talk about how to put together your motion record in the PDF stage and how, you know, what we mean by hyperlinking throughout the PDF. And we're going to talk about some issues that come up in that sort of area. And then third, we'll go into case lines and we'll look at, at uh, how to hyperlink around case lines. But before we do, I just want to say, you know, and we were talking about this before we started recording, it's kind of the wild west out there uh, when it comes to how judges want these hyperlinks done. Um, I'm going to show you how I, I'm doing it now. And this is February 14th, Valentine's Day, 2022. And this is how I'm doing it now. It could change tomorrow. So I want you, even though you're watching this and we're going to give you some help, helpful basic tips to go out and see if anything's changed or if there's been a direction from the, the court that says, no, you know, people were doing it this way. Some people are doing it that way. Now we want it this third way. That could always come at any moment. It could come while we're filming this video. So I just want everyone who's watching this to make sure that they double check that this is the way that they want to do it. Um, so that's my sort of caveat. But we're, but basically, and and I think we'll just talk about this now as sort of the introduction. The point of hyperlinking and why we want to do all this extra work, because it is a lot of extra work we're about to show you today, is that you, your friend, your lawyer, or your opposing uh, party on the other side, and the judge can navigate the documents that you're dealing with, whether it's in court or whether they're reading it you know, before court and preparing for court, as best as possible, and that they don't get angry with you which will hurt your case, right? Now, Heather, we, we discussed the case last week. We circulated the case that talked about this. If you want to go in and say what the judge was thinking about in that case. And I can't yes. remember what it's called, but maybe you can. I will um, talk about the case and we'll put a link to it in the video. Essentially what happened was the defendants brought a summary judgment motion. It was a slip and fall. They said it was simple. It could be decided on affidavit evidence. And in doing so, they gave the court what was a huge motion record, lots of transcripts, lots of material. And the judge said that given the information provided, he wasn't willing to grant a judgment to dismiss the case. And part of the reason that he came to that conclusion was that he thought the material was very complicated. And what made it look complicated was that all the information was given to him in a way that couldn't be navigated easily by clicking on hyperlinks. So they would mention um, an affidavit evidence and a factum, and he couldn't just click on the factum citation, take him to the affidavit evidence that was referenced, and he was expected to go through um, which would be like banker boxes, imaginary banker boxes of material, not easily sorted for him to look at. And when you do it that way, when you present material that makes a judge go through, um, we'll call it imaginary banker boxes, it make, gives the impression you have this very complicated motion. And if you're trying to tell the judge that this whole case can be decided, by answering one question simply, then through the form that you've given the material, you've undermined that argument. Mm. And I just wanna add something to that because in, in the old days with the banker boxes worth of material, it was actually easier in a lot of ways to find, find the document you're looking for because you would have you know, a book, uh, these bound document books. You'd say, okay, go to document book number seven tab 16 or whatever it is, and then they could just go there. And all those page numbers were on the page in, in order. And it was, it might be annoying to have to go look for the book, but you could do it and you could find the book. And what we're going to talk about later, when you upload into case lines, all the page numbers change. 
there's no uh, easy way to find um, a page number unless everyone agrees that we're using this certain page number system and everything is labeled in that page number system and everyone knows the document's page number that you're looking for. And I think when we read behind the, the lines of this case, the judge wasn't able to do that. Mm -hmm. The judge was just able to find, you know, what everyone was calling page 551. He wouldn't be frustrated, but he couldn't get there. And maybe he could, but it took him 10 minutes to find each page and that, you know, I think he said in there, well, I'm ready to dismiss the case just yes. based on that alone. Right? And Justice Myers in another decision also mentions the importance of case line page numbers. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, what makes a presentation easy to listen to is that everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. And as Dan mentioned, the best way to be on the same page is to know your case line number. And if you have it hyperlinked, again, it makes it easier to jump to different case lines. That's great, both of you. So um, uh, thank you so much for the great summary, Heather. Uh, and so Dan, now back to you. Do you want to show us some um, a little bit of uh, tips and guidance? Sure. So I'm just, like I said, I'm going to show you what I do. Uh, I'm putting myself sort of out there right now uh, to be, I guess, told <laughs> that I'm doing it all wrong and, and um, you know, have people commenting on your videos saying that guy, Dan, doesn't know what he's doing. But in my defense, I think no one really knows what they're doing. And I'm trying to do it in the best way uh, possible. And it, so far, it's been OK with me. So I'm going to show you guys what I do. And like I said, we're going to start with Microsoft Word documents. And specifically, we're going to talk about uh, linking to outside case law, right? right. The, the new way that we do things in the Superior Court and in other courts as well is if we're going to refer to authority, we don't put in a separate authority book anymore mm -hmm. unless that we have cases that you can't find on Canada or on another, what they call a public database. So maybe the Ontario Court of Appeals' own website or the Supreme Court's mm -hmm. own website or something like that, right? But usually we use Canly. So I'm just gonna talk about how we deal with cases that we find on Canly. So Sounds uh, good. I'm gonna share my screen. Yep. Now, this is just a case that I just pulled up. I don't know anything about this case. I just clicked a couple of things. If you remember back when Heather Douglas was talking, I might've been going like this because I was just looking at my screen trying to <laughs> find this case. I don't know anything about it. But let's pretend mm -hmm. I want to cite paragraph 20 of this case. It's a court of appeal case. You can see there's the three court of appeal judges down there. Yep. They say something about fresh evidence applications here. Let's say I want to um, cite this in my factum, right? So right. Stanley has these lovely chevrons now for new cases that are numbered. They put it on the side of just above each paragraph, right? Right. So if I want to cite paragraph 20, I'm going to click on the chevron and it's going to bring me a menu. Oh, wow. That's you didn't so know that? smart. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I had that on my Canly tutorials. <laughs> so what we can do here, and, and for the purposes of what we're talking about today, we have two very important uh, options here that, from this link, right, from this drop down menu. One is copy the citation and two is copy the link. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm just gonna show you how, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna copy the citation. I'm gonna click it and now it's says citation is copied to your clipboard, okay? Right. So I'm gonna unshare and I'm gonna now take you to a Word document. So I'm just picking up a, 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 a Word document that I have on my computer. I'm sure. gonna share that with you now. And I'm gonna pretend that I wanna cite paragraph six here yeah. with that case that we just talked about. Right. right? So what, the old days and, and the way that I still sort of like to do it, but I don't do it anymore, is we would have a citation underneath here. We would put the name of the case. Right. But what right. we can also do is we can put our uh, um, cursor where we want it. If we go to references here at the top of Word, we then go to insert footnote. And then we can just copy in our case citation right down there. Oh, now we still nice. have a little bit of extra work to do because the way Canly does it is it gives you a bunch of extra stuff that you don't need. So I don't think the judge cares what time I looked up <laughs> this case on, on Canly. So I'm going to delete that. Yes. And as you can see, there's these two, I guess, sideways chevrons there that are blocking my link. So when I delete those uh -huh. and I go to the end and just press the space bar, I now have a link. Right. Fantastic. So yeah. you can see if, if, if the judge wants to see the citation, yeah. I now have a link down here that uh, is um, 
usable, right? And the judge can see this is the case you want. I mean, I'm still going to do this in italics and all that other way to cite things, but those are yeah. just my personal preferences. Maybe they're important. Maybe that's up to you. But the link is there, and it'll take me to the case. If I click it, um, well, you can't see because I'm not sharing my whole thing, but it, it, it'll take me there. Okay. Right. Does the court um, have a preference for footnotes? Ver sorry, yeah, yeah, footnotes versus in-text citation? Because I I've read cases like I've heard it both ways. Mm. Like, do you know of uh, do either of you know if there's like a definitive authority on this? I don't know about the definitive authority, but I know there's been heated heated uh, arguments about this on Twitter okay. uh, with with very <laughs> experienced and good lawyers that go back and forth about this. I personally like the older way of doing it where you put it under the paragraph. So I just I. like that because it's I, it's just the way I sort of learned to do it. But I find with the way I just showed you how to do it on Canly yeah. and it's just easier and cleaner this way. Yes, I prefer the footnotes myself. I find right. it easier to format, but I have, I'm kind of confused because to my knowledge, I don't think there's a very clear practice direction that sanctions one over the other. There, I don't think there is. And there's also another thing which uh, has been brought up is when you cite the footnote way, mm -hmm. you'll put your, your citation in the middle of a paragraph, potentially, if that's where you want to cite, right? Right. The other way, you can't. And it can be misleading when you cite at the bottom of a paragraph and you have multiple points in that paragraph, which point you're actually uh, you know, su supporting with that citation. Mm. So it's more accurate to do it this way as well, right? So anyway, so that's one way to do it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take you back now to, to, uh, to can. So here we go. I'm going to show, share my screen. Now, this is the Partition Act. I just picked this statute because mm -hmm. it's there, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, let's say I want to um, link to section two of the Partition Act, okay? So in my factum, I'm going to say something like, Section two of the Partition Act says any person interested, whatever. Or if I, in my fact, I want to say the Partition Act section two says blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. What I'll do is I'll go to my drop down menu again on the side of Canley. Mm -hmm. This time I'll copy the link. Okay. So now I don't have the citation, I have the link. So mm -hmm. you can see the link is copied to my clipboard. I'm going to go back to my. Um, my uh, factum here that I'm showing you guys. And you can see in this factum that I'm showing you, I've actually already done it. I've done this to the Assessment Act, not the Partition Act. So mm -hmm. if I wanted to say, you know, let's pretend uh, I, this was the Partition Act, I would select it. Mm -hmm. You know, this would say Partition Act, not the, the County of Wellington. I would right click and bring me a drop down menu. I go to link, that'll open this up. I just put the address in here, I paste it in. And then I click OK. Now you see that's turned blue. Hmm. And when I click it, it takes me right to the link that I clicked in there. Yeah. OK. OK. So those are the two ways that I find myself linking the most within Word. One is I'll do a citation for a case that, that as you see down here, the, the, the actual Canly link that we just did before. I deleted that, but whatever you saw before, that's the similar that's here. Mm -hmm. Or in the the actual text turns into linkable text. And we do it those two ways through can. 